Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your Holy Church. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God. And to you we give glory together with your eternal Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Our speaker this evening is the Director of Academic Research and President of the Pontifical Studies Foundation, which supports the work of the Eucharist Project. Dr. Kenneth J. Howell taught in higher education for almost 30 years, most recently for over a decade as a professor of religion at the University of Illinois, where he taught classes on the history, theology, and philosophy of Catholicism. At the same time, he served as the director of the Institute of Catholic Thought of the St. John's Catholic Newman Center at the same university. He was a Presbyterian minister for 18 years, and during his ministry and teaching, Dr. Howell's own reading on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist started him on a six-year journey that eventually led him to Catholicism. On June 1, 1996, Dr. Howell was confirmed and received into the Catholic Church at St. Charles Borromeo Parish in Bloomington, Indiana. In 2000, he received the Pro Ecclesia at Pontificate. Uh, at Pontificia Award, the lay equivalent of the title Monsignor, from Pope John Paul II in recognition of his service to the church. Dr. Howell has been married to Sharon Canfield for 42 years, and they have three children and six grandchildren. On behalf of all of us here at the ICC, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Howell. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Father, for such a warm welcome. It is a great, I know people say it a lot, but it's a great privilege for me to be a part of this class in the Institute of Catholic Culture for several reasons, but one which I'll mention tonight, and, and that is I learned, started learning ancient Greek when I was 18 years old, and I've been reading it for over 40 years, and I'm heavily involved in a project, this Eucharist project that's translating all the Greek and Latin fathers for the first eight centuries of the church on the Eucharist, and also work in St. John Chrysostom. So I love the Eastern lung of the church. And so it's a great privilege for me to be associated with the uh, with the Institute of Catholic Culture. Well, there's a lot of you out there, and you didn't come to me hear me talk about myself. So let's dive right in and talk tonight about the development of the doctrine of the Trinity from the New Testament to the Council of Nicaea. The reason that this is important, well, there's several reasons, and I've mentioned some of them in the form of questions that I put on the handout. Now, I'm going to trust that you're looking at this handout so that when I refer to it, you'll have something to, to look at. But one of the big questions, both on a scholarly and on a level of doctrine for all Christians, for all Catholic Christians, uh, is the question of how we put together the doctrine of the Trinity from Scripture, uh, whether it can be done from Scripture alone, as I used to think as a Protestant, how it developed all the way to the Council of Nicaea, and what was involved. Let me just give you one little clue as to why I became a Catholic. One of the things I realized in studying the book by John Henry Newman, The Arians of the Fourth Century, and studying the Council of Nicaea itself, was the realization of how much the Church Fathers at Nicaea depended upon the tradition that came before them. And of course, as an evangelical Protestant, 
I thought that that was, well, okay, but not the best way to approach the Bible. And I found out that they really didn't rely on the Bible alone in the sense that evangelical Protestants often say. But what they did was they used Scripture, of course, as the very ground and foundation of everything, but then they they watched Scripture being understood and interpreted through history. So we're going to be studying about this history and what it teaches us. Tonight, specifically, we're going to be looking at the scriptural foundations, the references in the Old and New Testaments that have to do with the Trinity or indicate the Trinity, and then we're going to watch that development through the end of the second century. Now, next week, we're going to take the third century and then the fourth century leading up to and and including the Council of Nicaea. I'll also mention a couple of post-Nicene fathers, particularly Athanasius, of course, great defender of the Trinity, and Hilary of Poitiers in his uh, defense of the Trinity as well. And we'll just touch on those briefly. What I'm going to do at the very end of this series is to talk about how the doctrine of the Trinity is something that should shape our prayer life. And I'll refer to some of the modern saints like Elizabeth of the Trinity, the great St. Elizabeth, the great uh, Carmelite who was just canonized, in fact, this past year, and so a few others that talk about the centrality of our faith in the Trinity. In any case, you'll see on the outline there are some of the questions that we're going to be dealing with. And so in order not to take up too much time, I won't uh, read those out. You can read them yourself. There's some terminology and concepts there that you'll be hearing me refer to as time goes on. On the second page, you'll notice kind of an overview of what we're going to be doing in these four sessions. And as I said a few moments ago, the first one, session tonight that we're beginning now, is the biblical roots of the Trinity. And then secondly, and we'll talk about the Trinity and the fathers of the second century, where people have debated and disputed uh, the question of whether one can really see the Trinity in those fathers. I think we're going to see the development of doctrine in a very natural and organic way. So I want to ask you to turn to the next page on your outline, which is session one, the biblical roots of the Trinity. And let's begin with some scriptural texts that have been the occasion of many Christians, uh, both East and West, reflecting on the, the nature of our triune God. Let's go first to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. This text, of course, is in the context of the story of creation, uh, which gives us the very foundation of the physical or created universe. What's interesting about the the book of Genesis, or chapter 1 particularly, is the way it begins. In Hebrew, it begins with the words, Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et HaAretz. It jumps right into the story of God from the point of view of creation. And that's significant because the church fathers often remind us that God is so far above us. God is so infinitely greater than us that we can never know God in the sense that we know another human being or that we can't understand God in that way. But that doesn't mean we can't know God. We can, in fact, know God if we go to him through the created order which he's given, and especially through the greatest of all of his creations, the incarnation of his only begotten Son. And so scripture opens with the words, in the beginning God created. Now, as the story goes on, we come down to the last day, the sixth day of creation, where we find the words that are written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man, or human beings, in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle and all the land and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. There's actually a lot in there about 
the nature of human beings in their place in the world. But I want to focus for just a moment on the change in the verb forms that's here in Genesis chapter 1. Prior to this point in the creation narrative, we hear words like, let it be, let the earth come forward, let the animals come forward. But when we turned to verse 26, we have a different change in the verb form. The Hebrew verb na'aseh, let us make, suddenly switches from the third person to the first person. And we might ask the question then, if God is a solitary being, why does it say, let us make? There's various explanations, of course, that have been offered. The one that's probably most prominent in the history of Jewish interpretation of this text is what we might call the royal we, something like a, a King Henry or a, you know, King Elizabeth might say, let us make merry. And it means, of course, I'm commanding you to, to make merry, to be happy. In other words, if the royal we that expresses the desire of the king for everyone. So what does let us make mean? Well, of course, it could mean exactly what I just said, the way that the Jews understand it. But for Christians, as they have read the text of the Old Testament through the eyes of fullness in the New Testament, they saw in that text a hint. And that's the proper word, I think. They saw a hint. They didn't see a doctrine necessarily, but they saw a hint of something that might be pointing forward to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So here we have on the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, an indication that raises a question for us. Who is God and what kind of God is he? What I'm going to hopefully leave you with over these four hours that we're together, is the absolute and complete majesty of our God. The God who made the heavens and the earth is the God who is alone to be worshipped and adored as the great and sovereign king, as the master, as the Eastern Fathers like to use the word despotes. It doesn't mean despot in the modern. It just means the loving master who's given his creation of himself. Let's turn to a second text very quickly, and that is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Those of you Bible students will recognize immediately that Deuteronomy 6-4, of course, is the famous creed of ancient Israel. Shema, hear, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And on the handout, I've given you three different translations of this because it could, in fact, be translated any one of these ways. It could mean, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It could mean, The Lord our God is one. Or it could mean, The Lord our God is the Lord alone. Most commentators, both Jewish and Christian, will recognize that there's two aspects of God or two angles from which the writer is viewing God. One is the utter uniqueness of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah centuries later would say it, that I am the Lord, I am Adonai, and there is none like me. The second thing, of course, is that this is the numerical oneness of God. And in a time, and in a culture steeped in polytheism, and I want to stress that, in a time and in a place and in a culture where the idea of one sovereign master over the universe was a unique idea, it was a novel idea, it would have been very difficult for the ancient Jewish people, the people of God of the Old Testament, to embrace such an idea. But just because something's difficult to embrace doesn't mean it shouldn't be understood and studied and ultimately embraced. And that is what we're going to see in the Trinity. The Trinity was, for some people, very difficult to embrace 
the truth that was articulated at Nicaea. One last comment about this text. Don't know if you read Hebrew or not, but I've given you the, the Hebrew text there. And of course, you may know that Hebrew is written from right to left. So the third word there is a four-letter word in Hebrew that we think was pronounced Yahweh. Right? Of course, you've probably heard songs in the Catholic Church with that there. But remember that the ancient Jews never pronounced the name of God. Why? Because God's name was too holy and was indicative of his person, as it were, that was so majestic and above us, so infinitely greater than us, that they did not dare to speak his name, lest they break the commandment to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Well, anyway, what this did was it set the groundwork for the first important truth that there is only one God, and that this God is, in fact, one and not many. Then let's turn to the third text that I'd like to look at tonight, and that is Isaiah chapter 6. And of course, both within the Eastern and Western liturgies, we read this text in the light of our liturgical experience And we come away with a much deeper understanding of who God is. But we do need to remember that this text in Isaiah chapter 6 was a text that was spoken in the 7th or the 8th century B.C. And I'm going to turn to it in my Revised Standard Version, because I think this is a very good version uh, to look at in this regard. It tends to be just a tad more literal. Try to place yourself back for a moment. In the time of Isaiah, on the streets of Jerusalem in the 8th century BC, and here's what he has to say. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And the one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The response of the prophet Isaiah becomes a model for the response for all of us. Because when he hears the angelic choir, the seraphic choir, saying, holy, 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 he falls upon his knees, as it were, and says, woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Adonai, Sivaot. Of course, we know that the story goes on in which the seraphim take the burning coals from the altar of heaven and they touch Isaiah's lips with it and they ordain him, as it were, to become the prophet of the Lord for the wayward people of Israel. But tonight, I want to focus upon the words of verse 3. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is Adonai, the Lord of hosts. And the question that we want to ask is this. If God is one, and only one, numerically one, why does this text repeat this central definition of who God is as the Holy One? The answer could be several things. Thinking now for a moment, as a Jew would think of this text, they would have explained this perhaps as a superlative form. Here's the way it said it. If it said that David is bigger than Joseph, it would have said David is big than or of or from a Joseph. It didn't have any way of expressing no verbal form for the superlative. No way to say the biggest, except one way. And that was simply to repeat it three times. So they would have explained this text 
as referring to the fact that God is the very holiest thing that we can ever conceive. Now, again, thinking like a Jew, this, of course, does not prove the Trinity. But it is, again, suggestive. Suggestive that as a Christian, knowing the truth that's been revealed in the New Testament and through the history of the church, going back and seeing this text, our senses are awakened. And we say, wow, wait a minute. Could this be referring to the fact that the Father is holy? The Son is holy? The Spirit is holy? Well, to be fair to the text, no, it doesn't say that, but it is suggested. So these Old Testament texts are some of the texts which, in fact, the early church fathers quite often would reflect upon in their reflections of the meaning of the Trinity. Parenthetically, I might just mention, by the way, that I've translated passages of St. John Chrysostom's homilies on Isaiah 6, and he discusses this very fact in the homilies. But the main thing that he makes the point is is this, that the overall picture that is in this text of Isaiah seeing the glory of God, the kavod Adonai coming down from heaven, is exactly, says St. John Chrysostom, what the liturgy is. You see, the liturgy of the church is the union of heaven and earth. It is that unique place, like no other in our daily experience, where we can meet God under the objective conditions of worship and adoration. That's important, because I am convinced the more that I read the church fathers, that They never did theology in the academic sense the way that we do it. Their theology grew out of their liturgical and Eucharistic experience of the church. And thank God, that's something that has been better preserved in the Eastern uh, lung of the church than in the West. We have it in the West, but I think it comes out more prominently within the Eastern experience of the church, the Greek-speaking church. So, with this background and understanding, let's turn now to the New Testament and see what it has to say that might be in some way illuminating. All right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. This is the story of Jesus' baptism, which we just celebrated, of course. And then it says that Jesus was going from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. And John tried to forbid him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? And then Jesus said to him, Permit it now, because thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him. That Jesus was baptized, when he was baptized, he came immediately out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. And then a voice came out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There's two points that I want us to pick up on out of this text tonight. First of all, Jesus' complete identification with us in the Incarnation. Incidentally, there's a great German theologian that I strongly recommend reading, if you never have. Not so much a modern German, but uh, more of a uh, 19th century great Catholic theologian. And by the way, just as hopefully a bit of a humorous story, When I was studying, I studied in the Protestant seminary, and I'm proud to say, I guess you might say, that it was one of the best Protestant seminaries in the United States. It was a very rigorous theological program. We studied a lot about the history of German theology, and I never heard about this theologian. His name was Father Matthias Schaben, 
he wrote a book that every educated Catholic ought to read. It's called The Mysteries of Christianity. And it's absolutely a tremendous book. In this book, he says something that I have also come to as one of my deepest convictions, that the heart and soul of our faith lies in this truth, that the Logos, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Even if we were only describing Christianity from a sociological point of view, we would have to say that Christianity is absolutely unique among the religions of the world, in that the sovereign God of all has come to be a part of who our own physical, material reality. When Jesus responds to John, permit it now to fulfill all righteousness, we might ask the question, well, what is fulfillment of righteousness is this going to be? To be honest with you, when I was a Protestant minister and a theologian, I found myself puzzling over that quite a bit as to what that could possibly mean until I found the answer, guess where? There in the church fathers. What do they say? And they say this almost unanimously when they talk about the baptism of Jesus. They say two things. They say that the fulfilling of righteousness is not righteousness in the sense of personal goodness, but righteousness in the sense of what is fitting for our humanity. The incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ is what fits with our nature as human beings. And that's something that's so beautiful about the Catholic faith, that it accords with our human nature that God made us and that he puts inside of us, so to speak. But it is also fitting that he should come to be our elder brother, as it were. He is our God, but he's also identified with us. And that's that beautiful tension, as it were, between the transcendence of God as Logos, he's over and above and infinitely greater. But as a man, he is with us, and he identifies with us. The second side of this text that I think is important is, of course, that here we have the manifestation of the Son who comes to be baptized. We have a manifestation of the Spirit who comes down in the form or under the symbolism of a dove. And then thirdly, the voice that comes out of heaven. And notice, uh, as Jesus is beginning his public ministry, the voice comes down, and what does it say? The voice says what we can never allow to escape our memories, and that is that this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, is truly the beloved Son of the Father. And what we're going to see at the end of this session about the Trinity is that, as Matthias Shaban says in The Mystery of Christianity, he says that we become sons in the Son. We are taken up into the sonship of Jesus Christ. And we experience that Trinitarian life in our own souls. That's what the great mystics of the church know better than those of us who have studied theology with our minds. They've studied theology with the whole of their being. They've immersed themselves in prayer. Okay, so that text, I think, sets the groundwork, as it were. Now, I chose to read the story of Jesus' baptism from Matthew. Because let's turn to the end of the Gospel of Matthew now and read the famous Great Commission. The time when Jesus, standing outside of Jerusalem, says to his apostles, go and make disciples of all nations. And of course, if we attend very carefully to the details of the text, we come away again with two important things. Well, actually three. Verse 18, Jesus reminds his apostles that all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, I ask myself the question, here's Jesus resurrected from the dead. Forty days later, why would he have to remind them that he possesses all authority? 
Shouldn't they have gotten the message by now? Well, the problem is this. Remember Peter before the resurrection? He was constantly misunderstanding Jesus. Well, Jesus wants to make sure they don't misunderstand this. But there's a second reason, and that is they are going to face troubling times. They're going to be brought before the Sanhedrin. They're going to be brought before pagan emperors like Nero in Rome. And they're going to need courage. They will have to remember who holds the ultimate authority. So he reminds them, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Now, it's probably evident from the English text, but the Greek text here makes it even crystal clear as to what Jesus is emphasizing. He uses the word in verse 19 that we translate, make disciples, mate tusatet. Make disciples, that's the main command. Look at the scope of the command. All nations do not rest content until all nations have come under to become disciples, my disciples. Now, by the way, we should try to remember to read the Greek word ethne, from which we get the word ethnic, not as a modern nation state. For example, America is a nation, or Canada is a nation. But look how many different kinds of ethnic groups live in America and in Canada, right? Well, nations tended to be almost synonymous with ethnic groups in the ancient world. So what he's really saying, to use the language of the book of Revelation, every tribe and tongue and nation should be evangelized, should be discipled for me. Now, the second and last point, how is that going to take place? It's going to take place through baptism and through teaching. Now, it's significant, I think, that this is in the Gospel of Matthew. Because if you go back to the end of Matthew chapter 9, you will discover there that there's a summary of Jesus' ministry on earth, in which it says that he went about in various villages doing two things, teaching and healing. There is the twofold ministry of the church, to teach us and to heal us. The healing comes through the sacraments. That's why he mentions baptism. Baptism is the sacrament, of course, of initiation, the sacrament of entrance into the church. Now, for our purposes tonight, let's then take note of, of course, this Trinitarian formula of baptism. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This might be pushing the point a little bit too far, but I'm going to do it anyway, just to sort of see where it might lead us. You notice that it says, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, not in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't it significant that the word name is in the singular? Perhaps it is, because in the Jewish culture of the time, the name was also representative of the person. And they thought of that connection perhaps more clearly than we do today. For example, I have a, a friend, and he's an American friend of German extraction, but he's married to a Japanese woman. And they named their children Japanese names. And everybody that uses the name in Japan, apparently, knows the meaning of their name. Well, let's take Ken. Even though, as you see me on the screen, you would never guess that my name means handsome. Um, nevertheless, that's supposedly what it means. All right. Well, maybe that was many, many years ago. Well, anyway, uh, whatever the case, I didn't know the name, the meaning of my name growing up. Although somebody like Daniel would. Why? Because Daniel means God is judge. And we know that from Hebrew. So what does the name mean? Well, what it's indicating is that there is this one entity, perhaps like we saw in the book of Deuteronomy, but now he explicates that one entity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So is it any surprise then that we hear 
St. Paul at the end of 2 Corinthians, the very last verse, a verse that we sometimes hear in liturgy and that many different churches use, in 2 Corinthians 13, 13, where he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all we all. As you look at that text, it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the koinonia of the Holy Spirit. That is significant. Because this word koinonia will be the uh, word that the church fathers are going to use to talk about later the communication of the attributes in the two natures of Christ. But it will also be a word that some of the church fathers will use to describe the sharing of life and love between the different members of the Trinity. In other words, God in his very being is a, has koinonia. And so when Paul is blessing us, as it were, with the koinonia of the Holy Spirit, he is saying that we're going to share in this Trinitarian life as human beings. I don't know about you, but frankly, that just knocks the socks off me. The fact that we, as lowly creatures, could actually share in the very life of God. I mean, there is absolutely no higher calling than that. Let's skip now. I want to go down to John chapter 14 and verse 25. This is in, of course, the famous farewell discourses in the Gospel of John, which begins in chapter 14. And it is in these three chapters, 14 through 16, that he has these passages about the work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, John's chapter 14, verses 25 through 28. Well, I think we'll just read 25 and 26 should be sufficient. These things I say to you, while I am with you, but the advocate, the paraclete, or the comforter, different ways to translate it, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of the things that I've said to you. That is, by the way, significant, when the way that he says that, because As Catholic Christians, we believe that the definitive public revelation was finished with the apostles. As they stated the faith, after that, the purpose of the bishops of the church and the priests, and we lay people too, our task is one of preservation. You're going to see that at the end tonight when I give you this quotation from Tertullian, because all of the church fathers, at least all that I've read, All of the church fathers had the same idea about heresy. Heresy is an invention. It's a novelty. Because the responsibility of the church is not to make up doctrines. It's to explicate and to develop what was there in the deposit of faith, in the deposit of revelation. Now, this text, this first one, I want to note this fact that Jesus says, that the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit in his name. And we might ask the question, well, what does that mean, in his name? And one explanation could be that he's going to send the Holy Spirit with the same authority that he sent the Son into the world with, so that in listening to the Holy Spirit, they are going to be listening to Jesus Christ. That is what makes the church utterly unique. The church is the only organism and organization on the face of the earth that can speak with complete divine authority. And so the church is not like any other human organization on the face of the earth, which reminds us of the privilege of being his children. And right now, for a few moments, 
I'd like to turn to the very first chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 1 and verse 1. You notice how on the handout, how I had described that? The most profound theodicy in history? Well, the word theodicy usually is used in a context about the argument for God, defending God against the accusations of uh, the non-existence of God based on evil. In other words, people say, there can't be a God, he can't be a good God because of evil in the world. And then the retort to that is a theodicy. It's a justification of God. Of course, I'm not talking about that or in that context. But what we have in the Gospel of John in the opening verses is a kind of theodicy. It's a justification of the ways of God. And what is strange about this is how this would have offended the sensibilities of both Jews and Greeks. Why Jews? Because in a thoroughly Jewish mind, God and man can never meet in one person, or only in the sense that a prophet could stand in for God. But you can never say that a man is God. Remember what they said in the Gospel of John later? When they said, by calling God his Father, he made himself equal to God. And you know what? The Jews were absolutely right. No one should have the blasphemous audacity to say they speak for God, which is why Kabbalism is so difficult to believe. It took me six years to become convinced that in church, indeed the church is the voice of Jesus Christ in the world. This text in the beginning, in Arche en Hologos, in the beginning was the Logos. The reason I want to take a moment to think about this text is this. I'd like you to read this text, but not translate the word Logos. You see, as soon as we use the word word in English, we've already made an interpretation. I'd like you to get the original force of this text by retaining the word logos. Because what does logos mean? It means so much more than word. What does it mean? It means reason, thought, rationality. It means in a philosophical context, the ultimate rationale and explanation of the universe. The very famous physicist, the Locassian professor, of mathematics at Cambridge University, uh, Stephen Hawking, wrote a book called The Theory of Everything. And he says in this book that the goal of physics, the goal of all science, is to have this theory of everything, to reduce the universe to an equation. John is giving us a theory of everything. His theory of everything is that everything in the universe is explained by the existence of the Logos. And notice how important that is. You see, if we could reduce the universe to an equation, be it E equals MC squared or whatever it might be, we would only be having a knowledge of the universe. We wouldn't be explaining how that got into the universe in the first place. John is explaining how we got the universe and where it came from. It came from the Logos. The Logos is the very source of everything in the universe, including our human reason. That's why when we use our minds to study nature in science, there's a correspondence between our minds and nature. It's because the Logos that created the universe is also operative in our human reason. Now, because of our fallen nature, we often misunderstand that. But it doesn't mean that our reason is completely uh, devoid of the ability to discover truth. Now, 
to stay on track and to come down to the point. Although this, this passage is so rich and so wonderful. I would love to be able to spend an hour just talking about this. Notice that if you do not insert the English word, word, or any other modern language, uh, in French verb or verbum in Latin, if you just stay with the logos, you'll notice that we do not know that this logos is a human person until we get down to verse 12. Actually, even in verse 12, come to think of it, we still don't know because in Greek, the word logos is masculine and those pronouns are masculine. And so we don't know what this logos is. And that's precisely the point. You're still, as it were, trying to figure out what he's talking about until we come to the punchline. Verse 14, this Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This, of course, is not a Nicene uh, Declaration of the Trinity. But you can see very clearly why. This would be the very foundation of the thought of the church in understanding that this Logos is something beyond the natural world, something that it says, as it says in verse 1, this Logos is God, and this Logos is, as it were, the outshining, the effulgence of the glory of God. You notice in that text when it says that he's the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We often think of glory as almost equivalent to honor. And the word is used that way in Christian Greek. But I think in this context, it doesn't refer to an honor that we ascribe to God or that God even ascribes to himself. It's talking about the very being of God. God's very being emits a glorious light and shines out into the world. And I don't remember the exact quotations, but actually you hear that in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom or in the liturgy of things as St. Basil at Easter, you hear this theme of light coming out, that now the universe is filled with light because Christ, the risen one, reflects not an earthly life revived again, but a divine life that is coming and shining out of his physical being, which, of course, the church fathers tell us is exactly what happened at the transfiguration. The transfiguration was not a light coming down upon Jesus, but the light of his being, his divine being, shining out from him so that the disciples could participate. This provides us with the data, as it were, for the church's reflection upon this great mystery, the greatest mystery of all, the mystery of God himself, the tri-personed God. So we can go back to John chapter 1 and look again at verse 14. And I'm going to read through verse 18 because this provides something of the foundation for the church's reflection and formulation about the doctrine of the Trinity. Here's what the text says. The Logos became flesh. and dwelt among us, or pitched his tent among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John gives a witness about him and cried out with these words, This is the one of whom I said, the one who comes after me came before me, because he was before me, and from his fullness we have all received, and this phrase will be translated differently in different versions, but I'll translate literally first, grace in the place of grace, or grace 
instead of grace, or grace upon grace. And then verse 17 says, because the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm going to translate this rather freely now. God is a being that no one has ever seen. But the only begotten God, who is in the very bosom or heart of the Father, he has explained him. Now remember, when we were talking in our first hour about the Jewish experience of our brothers and sisters in faith before us in the time of Deuteronomy, when they confessed that the Lord, Adonai, the Lord is one. When Isaiah heard those words, holy, 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 we can almost sense that there was a cloud of mystery around who God was. And just parenthetically, I have Catholic Jewish friends. These are people that have grown up Jewish and have become Catholic. There is, by the way, a Catholic Hebrew Catholic Association uh, of Jewish people that have become Catholic. And they have told me, uh, several of them, on different occasions, that in their Jewish experience, as rich and wonderful as it was, they never really had what we would speak of as a personal relationship with God. And perhaps there's something that that reflects something about the new covenant and the revelation of the fullness of God in Jesus Christ. You see, it's one thing for a man or a woman to go through the motions of religion, right? In other words, many Catholics, unfortunately, never get beyond that. They go to Mass, they know the Mass by heart, but they never see the inner core that's beneath the Mass, what its real meaning is, the fact that it is the window into heaven. Because not only does the church give us icons, literally icons, the liturgy is an icon of heaven. It's a window into the supernal or eternal realm. That's what Jesus Christ is. If we could see, as it were, through his humanity, we would see into the very being of God. Which is why what John says here, I read, No one has ever seen God, but the only begotten God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, of course, the word only begotten in Greek is monogenes, which we know in Latin as unigenitus. This is the word that the church is going to struggle with over time. Why? Because to use the very word, monogenes, or to use the Greek verb genao, which means to give birth, implies that there was a time when the sun was not. Those of you that know your Arianism know very well that this was exactly the language of Arius. There was a time when the Logos was not. And this is quoted in the uh, Council of Nicaea that we'll talk about next week. Again, this is setting up, as it were, the problematic. Now, I wonder, I suspect that of the 231 participants that I see that we have with us tonight, some of you may be teachers. That is, you may be full-time teachers, or maybe you're catechists or whatever that you're, in other words, you're involved in instructing others in the faith. Now, as a teacher, I'll bet you you've also discovered something, that sometimes you have to pose a problem to your students. And in posing a problem to your students, you want them to wrestle with that problem. And sometimes you give them a problem like in mathematics that's probably beyond their ability to solve. But the whole point of the learning exercise is to struggle to understand the problem. And then you, later on as a teacher, come in and voila, there you are. You give this clarity to the whole thing by explaining to them the solution to the problem. Well, that's a good analogy for the pedagogy of the church. 
the Lord in Scripture and the apostles in the Scriptures and then the church fathers later, they use language that raises questions for us. And we don't always know exactly how to fit that language together. For example, let's go back for just a moment to that John chapter 14 that we looked at, verse 28. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I have said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. It's not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled or disturbed. You heard me say that I'm going away and that I'm going and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father. And then here's the statement. Because the Father is greater than I. Because you can imagine, as they in fact did, the Arians of the 4th century picked up on this statement and said, you see, the Father is greater than the Son. Well, if God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are equal in glory and being, as the Council of Nicaea says, what does it mean when Jesus says, the Father is greater than I? Let's come back to that. But keep that in mind. But also remember this, John chapter 10 and verse 30. Of course, John chapter 10 is the the section of John about the good shepherd. But as Jesus explains this later on, he explains, for example, in verse 27, this is John 10, 10, 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I will give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Now, why can no one snatch them out of his hand? Because he says, my father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of the father's hand. And here's the statement. I and the Father are one. The Arians, just prior to the Council of Nicaea, and the Arians and semi-Arians later, spoke about this oneness between the Father and the Son as a union of their wills. Much like a husband and wife join their wills together, and they are united. So the Arians said that The Father and the Son are united in one will. We'll find that Hilary of Poitiers uh, denounces this as being not true to what the gospel really teaches. But I wanted to show you these things for just a moment so that you can see some of the scriptural texts that the church fathers will, will later wrestle with. But they didn't wrestle with them immediately. And so if we turn to the second session, the quotations that are there, we're going to see something of how the church thought about these terms in the second century. Now, to my knowledge, there were not any extensive commentaries on the Gospel of John or or even any other Gospels in the second century. Most of the writings in the second century are what we could call, or what they call a German Gelegenheitsschriften, their their occasional writings, the writings that are occasioned by a very specific situation, much like the letters of the New Testament are. But we do have enough writings from the second century to begin to figure out sort of how these people thought about things. So let's go, and if you have that sheet in front of you, we'll turn to the writings of the second century. And Daniel, you or Father can kind of stop me if I go into too much historical detail here, because I I don't want to get lost in historical details, but as a historian, it's it's easy for me to do that. But first about the Didache. All right, first historical detail here. 
we know about the writing called the teaching of the 12 apostles from it being referred to by other ancient writers. Right? They talk about this document, but so far as we know, this document was lost sometime. We don't know exactly when, probably the, the second, the end of the second, maybe the third century. Until in the year 1875, there was a Greek Orthodox bishop working in a library in Constantinople, and he found this codex, this ancient book. And as he's leafing through all the pages, he comes to a document, and he begins reading it. It's in very simple Greek, but as he begins reading it, he says to himself, could this possibly be? the teaching of the 12 apostles that the ancient writers are talking about? Well, long story short, yes, he came to the conclusion that this was the famous didache. Didache means just a word that means teaching in, in Greek. And so what we find in the didache, if you've never read it, it's, it's very simple reading. Um, I translated myself and published a translation and, and commentary on it. This text, is very clearly a kind of instruction manual for priests in the early church as to how to conduct the liturgy about the most important things. It contrasts the way of life and the way of death. But beginning in around chapter 6 or 7, there's the section that we call the liturgical section. It has to do with baptism and the Eucharist and the liturgy and so forth. The point I want us to see tonight is this is just to read together what it says. Now, concerning baptism, baptize this way. When you said all these things, I presume here he means perhaps the homily or some preliminary prayers, baptize into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit in living water. But by the way, the Greek word, can be translated either living water or running water. And in the next sentence, I translated it running water. If you don't have running water, baptize in another water. That is, I guess, water in a bowl or something, or maybe water in a lake. If you cannot do this in cold water, do so in more. And if you have neither, pour out water on their head in the name should have the word of there, in the name of the Spirit of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, from the very beginning then, we see a writer outside the New Testament using the language of Matthew. And some of you already know this probably from your studies, that the Didache is very clearly dependent upon the Gospel of Matthew. Some have hypothesized that the dependence is the other way, but we won't get into that dispute. That's a historical question that's beyond our concern tonight. What's clear is this. Here we have one of the earliest Christian documents that we know of. In very simple instructions, perhaps translated from Syriac, and it's instructing the priests or the deacons of the church how to baptize. And the baptism clearly in the late first or early second century has a Trinitarian formula. Some people will find this perhaps significant if you remember that in the book of Acts, the Trinitarian formula for baptism does not occur. There, it says that they're baptized into the name of Jesus which becomes the basis for the non-Trinitarian, you know, Unitarians or the Unity Pentecostals and people like that, or maybe the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses who do not believe in the Trinity. Here we have a clear formula. And because the church in the Catholic Church depends upon these other documents as witnesses to the faith of the church, here we find the church following the commands of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's go to our second text, the letter of Clement to Rome. 
Now, those of you that are Roman Christians, like I am, you know that in our first Eucharistic prayer, which is essentially the the, the first Eucharistic prayer is, is the Tridentine canon that used to be prayed all the time in the church. That first canon lists the, the bishops of Rome, the Pope. And it says in the Linus, Cletus, Clement. Clement then. There's Peter, then Linus, Cletus, and Clement. Linus and Cletus, or Anacletus, uh, are mentioned, at least Linus is mentioned in Second Timothy. And Clement then is the first pope, besides Peter, that we have a letter from. And we have a long letter from. And I've translated this letter as well. That's about 12,000 words. And in this long letter to the Corinthians, you can see the clear similarities between Paul's letters to the Corinthians and Clement's letter to the Sun. And like human nature, it never learns from its mistakes. And so what we, what do we find? We find the problem of schism in Corinth. Again, like Paul faced in the 50s of the first century, here we are in the 90s of that same century, right at the end of the century, and we find Clement having to correct the problems that are in the Corinthian church. Let's read that one. This is from chapter 58. Receive our counsel, and you will regret nothing. For God lives, and our Lord Jesus Christ lives, and the Holy Spirit lives, the faith and hope of the elect. Because the one who has practiced the requirements and commands given by God in humility, with an intense virtue, will be in good order and enrolled among the number of the saved through Jesus Christ, through whom is glory to him, that is to the Father, forever and ever. Amen. Now, I translated this rather literally in order to allow the reader to sort of interpret it for himself. I didn't want to interpret it for you, but the more literally you translate something, sometimes the more awkward it is. But for our purposes, it's significant here to see that Clement speaks about God living, our Lord Jesus Christ living, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I put living in there. That brackets means that the Greek word live didn't occur in that particular instance. But I think it's clearly implied here. And then at the end of this passage, it speaks about Jesus Christ through whom is glory to the Father. It's kind of a benediction at the end of things, much like the way the church fathers end their homilies. And St. John Chrysostom almost ends almost every homily with glory to the Father, honor to the Father through the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. My only purpose in us looking at this is this, that Clement, this third bishop of Rome after Peter, is referring to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in what seems to be the most natural way. There's nothing contrived here. There's nothing introduced. This is just the way Christians talk. There's no analysis. There's no theological reflection. It's just very natural for Christians to be Trinitarian in this sense. Although, again, the word Trinity doesn't occur in Clement's first letter. Let's go on to the next one. Ignatius of Antioch, whose seven letters are probably one of the clearest witnesses to the Catholic nature of the church, both its Catholicity in the sense of universality and its Catholic nature, meaning as opposed to Protestant or something like that. This is from the 13th chapter of his letter to the Magnesians one of those seven letters. Uh, Let me just make one historical note. This, we think, was probably written around 107, 108 AD. Certainly no later than 117, because that was when the emperor Trajan died and Hadrian became the emperor. And we know from later Christian writings that Ignatius lived during the time of Trajan, who was one of the greatest of the emperors of the Roman Empire. Now, here's the point. Ignatius was probably at this point in Smyrna, in 
Western Asia Minor, visiting with Polycarp, who was a much younger bishop at the time, but still the bishop of Smyrna. He writes to the church that's not too far away, Magnesia, and here's what he says. So be diligent to be confirmed in the teachings of the Lord and of the apostles, that whatever you do, you be prospered in flesh and spirit, in faith and love, in the Son and the Father and the Spirit, in the beginning and at the end. This all is with your worthy bishop, or should be done. What it means is this should all be done with your worthy bishop and presbytery that is worthy of the woven crown and the godly deacons. Be subject to your bishop and to one another, as Jesus Christ in the flesh is subject to, it means, is to the Father and the apostles to Christ, the Father and the Spirit. The result is that your unity will be both physical and spiritual. I think he means external and internal. In other words, it will be both a physically manifest within the church, and it will also be a true spiritual, deep, profound unity within. Now, if you look up at the second line of that quotation, you'll notice that he uses these you know, double expressions. He says that you should be prospered in flesh and in spirit, that's the first one, in faith and in love, and then skip the next one, and he says, in the beginning and at the end. He uses these twofold expressions, except in the middle, he has an expression of three, where he says, in the Son and in the Father and in the Spirit. Why did he not just mention two of them? Because what he's trying to emphasize is that the prosperity that he wishes upon the Magnesian church that comes from the apostles and the teachings of the Lord are going to be in flesh and spirit and faith and love, but most of all, they're going to be in God. And who is that God? Not two, but three. Son, Father, and spirit. Again, there's no deeper reflection that we're going to find later in history, even tonight before we stop, we're going to find in Tertullian. But nevertheless, what you do find is what seems to be very natural, right? And again, the church often did this. For example, the church spoke of Mary as the Theotokos long before Nestorius denies it in about 429 A.D. The point is, the church has a way of worship and liturgy, and in its private devotion of its members, in its monasteries, as well as its public liturgy. And what do we find? The church adopts this language without necessarily analyzing what it is about. We're going to find this later on, and I'm writing several books about the Eucharist right now, in which uh, you you try to figure, well, was transubstantiation in the ancient church, and scholars debate all of this, but my point is only this. The word transubstantiation never occurs before about the ninth century in the history of the church. But the real question is, does it express in the ninth, tenth, and thirteenth centuries what the church believed in the second and third and fourth centuries. That's the question that we want to ask about the Council of Nicaea. Even though it uses language like homoousios and consubstantial, that language that becomes a formal part of our faith later on, does it express the faith of these earliest church fathers, even though they don't give that precise definition? Well, Ignatius is a clear witness to this threefold language about the the faith, all right? Then let's go to a letter that we think is around the mid-2nd century, maybe even earlier, and that's the Epistle of the Ignatus. Now, this one is a little bit maybe vaguer, but is nevertheless worth reading. Truly God himself 
hath sent from heaven and placed among men the truth and the holy and incomprehensible word, or logos it is, and has firmly established him in their hearts. He did not, as one might have imagined, send to men any uh, servant, angel, ruler, or any one of those who bear sway over earthly things. I think he means like governors and rulers. But who did he send? The very creator and fashioner of all things. By whom? He made the heavens. The same language that John uses in chapter 1 when he says, through this logos was the creation made. So again, we find an expression then of this, he calls the logos the creator and fashioner of all things, which is something in a Jewish mindset would have been only ascribed to God, could never be ascribed. To an angel. Let's go to the next one. This is a very short text, but an important text. And you can go ahead and read it online yourself. There's several quote, there's several translations online. And again, I translated in a book. I put together Polycarp and Ignatius in, in a book and get it gave a commentary on it and so forth. Scholars of the early church know very well that the 14th chapter of the martyrdom of Polycarp is a prayer that Polycarp prays ostensibly before he's ready to die. But if you examine the prayer itself, what you discover is that the prayer has all kinds of liturgical overtones to it. Now, this isn't as strange as you might think. Now, remember, we think that Polycarp was martyred in Smyrna, somewhere between 135 to 155, maybe even 65, going into the reign of Marcus Aurelius. Well, that's a big scope. But let's just settle on 145 to give us a date to work with for just a moment. Remember that Ignatius of Antioch in 107-108 visited Polycarp when he was going with his ten leopards, as he calls them, going through with the Roman guard on the way to Rome to be martyred. So from 107 to 145, we have 38 years. Now, Polycarp says later in this martyrdom that he's 86 years old. So 45, and then you had another 40-some years to it. He reaches back into the time when Peter and Paul were probably living on earth. This man has been praying the liturgy for at least 30 plus years. So when he spontaneously breaks out to pray before he meets his death, what kind of language do you think we might hear a man like that say? Might it be the language that he's been using for 30, 40 years of being a bishop? Well, that's exactly what we find in this 14th chapter. By the way, if you're looking for a prayer to model your prayer on, this is a beautiful prayer to do the whole thing. I've just quoted for you the third verse of it. For this reason, I praise you for all things, talking to God. I bless you. I glorify you through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your child. That word child is the Greek word pais, which could be translated servant as well. Through him and with him, in the Holy Spirit, be glory to you now and forevermore. Amen. You see where we got this? Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever, which is in the Western liturgy of the church, something very similar, though I can't quote it from memory, in the Eastern liturgies of the church. You see how long the church has been praying this liturgy? The church has been Trinitarian from its very core, from the very earliest times. Yes, or rather I should say no, they didn't reflect upon it. And they didn't necessarily try to give a catechesis on the Trinitarian God. But they believed in this God. It would only come later when challenged 
where they defined more carefully what this means. And next week, when I talk about the salvific criteria of the Trinity, what I mean is this, very simply, just to give you a little heads up. This is what St. Athanasius says. He says that if Jesus Christ were not fully divine, sharing that same nature with the Father, let's just say for the sake of argument that he was 99.9% God. According to St. Athanasius, he could save us 99.9%, but he can never take us back to the Father. And that is our true home, to go back to live in the bosom of the Father. Well, that's what St. Polycarp is saying in this wonderful martyrdom of Polycarp. Just for those of you that may have never read the martyrdom of Polycarp, it won't take you more than 30 minutes to read it. But it is absolutely beautiful. It is the first and oldest martyr that we have within the church. And it, to some degree, provides the model for later martyrdoms. Let's go on then to another great martyr for the church, Justin. You remember the story, perhaps, of Justin. Justin was born in Syria, and being a intelligent a searcher for truth, he studied all the different philosophies that he had available to him at the time. And then sometime, probably in midlife, he decided the philosophy that is the one that's true is the Christian gospel. But this was very difficult for the Greco-Roman mind to accept. Because in their minds, especially in the sophisticated philosophical minds, this Jewish prophet from far away in Palestine, why, who in their right mind would believe such a person? And of course, the emperor himself, Antoninus Pius, who was the emperor right around the 50s of the second century. Justin writes this long, I forgot how many chapters, it's about 68 or 69 chapters, this long uh, defense of the faith, this apologia, this defense. Now, there's so many things in Justin's things, but one of them I want to mention that might seem a little tangential at first, but I'll explain its importance later. Justin has an argument in the earlier chapters of this where he talks about the fact that God definitively revealed himself through the Hebrew prophets, but he did not leave himself without witness among the pagan Greeks. And so he refers to and quotes from Plato and the other philosophers, perhaps Stoic philosophers, as did Clement of Rome, by the way, referred to Stoic philosophers in chapter 20 of his letter. Justin Martyr refers to these pagans as well and talks about the fact that this logos, this supreme divine reason, was also operative in the pagan philosophers. And some of them responded in such a way that they began to see the light of God. And when you go back and sift through Plato, you do begin to see why the ancient Christian fathers began to see the wisdom in some of these ancient philosophers. I'll give you one example. According to Plato, and I've forgotten which dialogue it is, it might be in the Phaedo or the, or the Phaedrus, but he says, in essence, that there's a purpose for doing philosophy. Now remember, Philosophy in the ancient world isn't like our modern universities. Philosophy is conceived by them as being a way of living. That's why the church fathers, all the way up until the time of Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzen, St. John Chrysostom, they call Christianity a philosophy. What they mean by it is a way of living wisely. It's because philosophy, of course, means the love of wisdom. So what did they say? What does Plato say? The purpose of philosophy is to praise the divine. In other words, there's a liturgical consummation to philosophy. The purpose of 
philosophia, of pursuing wisdom, isn't just so that one can have a PhD behind his name or that one can, say, call himself professor of philosophy. No, no. The purpose of it is to praise the supreme ultimate reality that is the divine. Even a pagan like Plato could see that far ahead of our modern atheists. But nevertheless, we can see then why the church fathers could say that these pagan philosophers were kind of inching their way toward Christianity. Let's go ahead and read this then from Justin Martyr very quickly. This is a bit of a controversial passage that I've translated here, but he says, for not only among the Greeks were these things, he means the truths of wisdom, were these things condemned by reason. Oh, excuse me. This is where I was talking about the the kind of very anthropomorphic ideas among the Greek poets. That's what he's talking about, being condemned. These things were condemned by reason, the logos, through Socrates, but they were even condemned among barbarians. They were condemned by the logos himself. And he uses the word logos here possibly with two meanings. Who is the Logos himself? He goes on. Who was formed into a man called Jesus Christ. You see the power of John's statement now, back in chapter 1, verse 14? The Logos became flesh. That is inconceivable to the Greco-Roman mind to think that the ultimate rationale of the universe could come and live inside of a man? That's absurd. And that's the beauty of our faith. It is, from a purely human reason standpoint, yes, it is sort of absurd. Our faith is not against reason, but it goes so far beyond reason that we can say, wow, it looks on the surface to be absurd. And yet, how beautiful it is that it is absurd that the Logos, the divine reason of the universe, became man. He goes on with the quotation, It is him, that is Jesus Christ, it is him we obey. And do not affirm that the gods who do such things, the things he's been talking about, are not only not right, but they are evil and noxious demons. Their deeds are not even like those of men who long for virtue. In other words, he's contrasting the Christian idea of Jesus Christ with the popular ideas of God that you find in in Greco-Roman culture. So, he calls him the Logos, he calls him divine, and he makes an explicit connection between the rationale that we find in our brains that Socrates drew on and the Logos that is above us. Let's go to the next quotation from chapter 6 and verse 1. For all this, we are called atheists. Remember that? That Christians were called atheists. By the way, that occurs in the in the martyrdom of Polycarp too. The governor of, of Smyrna says to, uh, to Polycarp, uh, Polycarp, say away with the atheists, meaning away with the Christians, right? Because they didn't believe in the Roman gods. And Polycarp says, yeah, okay, away with the atheists. Of course, he's referring to those that don't believe in the Christian God. Anyway, for all this, we are called atheists. We confess that we are atheists with respect to those who are thought to be gods in this way, in the way you're talking about, but not with respect to the truest father of righteousness, wisdom, and other virtues. This God is untainted by evil. Now, remember, by the way, the Greek gods, Zeus and so forth, they can come down and have relations with women and give offspring, and there's this kind of a fluidity. But remember, this is the difference. In the Greco-Roman way of thinking about the interaction between the gods and humanity, the more of a man the god becomes, the less of a god he is. And the more that a man becomes divine, the less of a man he is. You see now the power of the incarnation? We don't have 50% man, 50% God. We have 100% God 
and 100% man. That is the powerful message of Christianity, of our Catholic faith. He goes on, This God is untainted by evil. Rather, we venerate and worship him and the Son that came from him when he came and taught us these things and the prophetic spirit and the army of good angels which escort him and are like him. We honor them with reason and truth. And he uses these different words, honor and worship, of course. Sometimes the words are a little bit fluid, but by and large, I think here is distinguishing between worshiping a creature like an angel or a saint versus worshiping God. Look at the next reference. Chapter 67. This, by the way, is the place where he's talking about the liturgy. And he says of this, and we afterwards, I think he's talking about after the liturgy, or I can't remember the exact context, but he's talking about the liturgical context. When af- we afterwards continually remind each other of these things, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together, that is, we, we come together we in solidarity, and for all things we are supplied with, We bless the maker of all through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. Let me make one point here. Notice he says, we we bless the maker of all through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Ghost. I should say the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? He's saying something that the later church fathers, especially after Nicaea, are going to make the point. That is, that within the triune God, the fact that you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means that the Father is what the Greek fathers call the principle without principle. What he means is Jesus Christ is part of the arche, or the principle that explains the universe, that explains salvation history. But this principle, that is the Logos, The Son, the eternally begotten Son, he has a principle that he comes from. What is that? That is the Father. The Father is the principle without any principle. The ultimate source of life, of love and goodness and everything within the Trinity is the Father. And so that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that in the resurrected body, We, Jesus Christ, will offer us back to the Father. The Father is the source of all holiness. Let's go here now to the last quotations. The other writing, the very famous writing of St. Justin Martyr, is the dialogue with Trypho the Jew. And uh, this is a great dialogue, but what's interesting about it is that Trypho is apparently, we don't know who he was really, but Like Philo, the Alexandrian Jew, he probably was not only cognizant and conversant with the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, but he was also very conversant with Greek philosophy. And so, Justin goes tete-a-tete, head-to-head with Typhro in debating these things. Here's what he has to say. This quotation, by the way, is not mine. I, I got it off the internet. God begat before all creatures a beginning. That Greek word, by the way, is arche. So you could translate it a principle. He first of all begat a principle before all creatures, a certain rational power from himself, who is called by the Holy Spirit. The glory of the Lord, and then the Son, again wisdom, again an angel, then God, and then Lord and Logos. He's talking about the different ways in which the scriptures talk about the Son of God. Sometimes it calls him an angel, because they interpret, by the way, in the Old Testament with angelic manifestations, sometimes as being manifestations of the Son of God. But notice the last one in the list, Logos. He was begotten of the Father by an act of the will. Just as we see happening among ourselves 
That, by the way, becomes a bone of contention later on. And when we give out some word, we beget the word. Yet not by cutting off so much as lusting the word in us, just as we have perceived in the case of fire, which is not lessened when it is kindled, but remains the same. And that which has been kindled by it likewise appears to exist by itself, not diminishing that from which it was kindled. Now, the reason why this is important is to think of it this way. When we give of ourselves, in some cases, we lose something. Although we don't lose anything when we give birth to children, because we give them a set of our chromosomes, and they get those, and we still have ours. I think what Justin is saying here is this that the Logos was generated eternally from the Father, but not such that the Father lost anything of his own being. It was just communicated to it. And in the same way, someday you and I will participate in the life of this Trinitarian God in the fullness. That's what's called by the medieval Western theologians the beatific vision. That experience will not in one any way lessen the life of God himself. Okay, final quotation, then we'll stop for questions. This is a very famous treatise. Uh, after Tertullian became a Montanist, now, his Montanism was bad, but it wasn't anti-Trinitarian. So I'm using this not because he did become a heretic, but not in respect to the Trinity. In that, he still gives witness to the church's teaching. So, let's look at it. Well, this is what the heretics were saying. In the course of time, the Father was born, and the Father suffered God himself, the Lord Almighty, in whom in their preaching they declared to be Jesus Christ. This apparently was a form of modalism. In other words, they were saying that there's one God, he's manifested first as God the Father, then as Jesus Christ the Son, then as the Holy Spirit. These are different names for the same being. That's what modalism was or is. We, however, he says, as we indeed have always done, and more especially since we've better been instructed by the paraclete, who leads men into all truth, he's alluding to John there, believe that there is only one God. But under the following dispensation, or ekonomia, as it is called, that this only one God also has a son, the word. I can't remember if he's a sermo or or verbum there, but in any case, the word. Who proceeded from him, by whom all things were made, and without whom nothing was made. You can see him there quoting from the Gospel of John. Him we believe to have been sent by the Father into the Virgin, and to have been born of her being both man and God, the Son of Man and the Son of God, and to have been called by the name of Jesus Christ. We believe, by the way, I've I've stressed that because the word is credo or credimus. It's almost like it's a confession of faith, like you're standing in church. We believe him to have suffered and died and been buried according to the Scriptures. And after he had been raised again by the Father, was taken back to heaven to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. Does this, by the way, sound like the Apostles' Creed? You see, there's all kinds of witnesses to the Creed in the Father's before Nicaea, who was sent from heaven, and according to his own promise, the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete, the sanctifier of the faith of those who believe in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Do you see how much clearer it's getting? By the way, I should tell you, Tertullian was the first so-called father of Latin theology. He lived in Carthage in the late second century, and he was an Orthodox man until the very end of his life. I guess went crazy, went off the deep end, and started following this guy named Montanus. But as far as the Trinity... He was still orthodox. He says this, that this rule of faith has come down to us from the beginning of the gospel 
even before any of the older heretics, much before Praxius, a pretender of yesterday, will be apparent from the lateness of the date which marks all heresies, and also from the absolutely novel character of our newfangled Praxius. Praxius, by the way, was promoting this heresy in the city of Rome. Now, here's my point. You can see a couple things here. One, the language is very clear of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a kind of profession of faith which will later be formalized in the Council of Nicaea. But this profession of faith is found in many. If you look at the screen, I'm holding up a book. This is in printed in Germany. It's called The Symbols of the Symbola de Altim Kirche. And it's a little book that has all the references to the creeds in the church in like the first two or three centuries of the church before the Council of Nicaea. It's got them the original Greek and Latin text. And by this is in German, they use the word symbol, comes from Greek, it means basically a creed. I won't go into any further explanation. You can see that creed that's here in Tertullian. But notice also what he says about Praxius. He calls him a pretender of yesterday the complimentary term for a heretic, right? In other words, he's saying, look, all heresy was born yesterday. Our job as Orthodox Christians is to hold on to the faith that was, to use the language of St. Jude, once and for all delivered to God's holy people. So what have we seen in summary? We've seen that there is a rich understanding of the fullness of God already expressed in the New Testament. But in the time of the New Testament, we don't have anybody challenging that in terms of what does this mean about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in fact, it doesn't seem that this was seriously challenged until about the end of the second century when we get these philosophies or these heresies which are trying to define this more carefully. Now, I didn't give you a quote from Tertullian here, but Tertullian is actually the one that first uses the term substance, substantia, with regard to the being of God. And this is what they call in Greek, usia, from which we're going to later hear the words homo usia and homoi usia. And these are the differences. Is the Son and the Father Do they have the same nature, or does the Son have a like nature with the Father? The Council of Nicaea says very clearly they have the same nature. That is crucial. Because every one of us looking at this video tonight, we have the same human nature. It just happens to come in two varieties, male and female. We have the same human nature. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they all share in this same nature. I'll leave you with this thought. Try to imagine reality before there was any creation. Are you thinking about nothing? Because that's all there was, except the being of God. There was this being, and this being was not a solitary being, lonely, and so he needed to create a man, like sometimes you hear people say. No, this God was the original fellowship, koinonia, and community of life and love, sharing together Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are in their communion with one another, the reality that defines all other reality that we experience in life. Thanks for being with us. I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Howell. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody watching tonight. That was really wonderful to see how, as you spoke about the uh, development of doctrine from the the witness of the Old and New Testament into the Apostolic Fathers, and to see that there's a true 
development from a uh, building off of a uh, preservation of the tradition handed down from the apostles as opposed to uh, a, a radical break from what mm-hmm. came before. And so it's a movement from the implicit to the explicit. Um, you brought that across very, very clearly, and that was wonderful. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, f- we're going to take some questions now. First of all, a couple people had some questions, Dr. Howell, about the German author that you recommended. Wonderful book. It's one of my favorites. If you want to tell them who that was, buy again. Yeah. In German, it's pronounced Matthias. It's like, it's Matthew. It's M-A-T-T-H-I-A-S, Matthias. And uh, Schaben is pronounced, it's spelled S-C-H-E-E-B-E-N, Matthias Schaben. And the book, um, which seemed a little prayer to St. Anthony because I was looking for a German copy, and I don't seem to be able to find it in my library. Maybe my son has it in Germany. I don't know. But anyway, the English translation, which is very hard to get, is called The Mysteries of Christianity. That's a literal translation of the German uh, that's there. You know, uh, just a note on that, there is a publishing company called Ex Fontibus that brought it back into print. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it is now back in print, and you can get it for, I think, around $25, $30. So. Oh, please send us that. I've got yes. to get a copy of that. Yes, yes. I have I'll, a German, but not in English. Okay, I'll send you the link to, to yeah. that edition. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's absolutely one of the most profound books I've ever read in my life. Mm-hmm. It's great. Great. All right, so let's uh, get with some questions here. So Kathy Cerrone asks, could the hints in the Old Testament be among the things that Jesus explained to the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Could they have relayed that to the apostles who then passed on that explanation orally? Well, that is a great question. And, of course, we'll never know that until we get to heaven. Uh, we can ask Jesus there, or the apostles, you know, or those two disciples that were walking along the way. Hey, by the way, what did he say to you when you were going to Emmaus? Which is one of my favorite pericopes in the whole Bible, you know, the wonderful story. I just wish I could have been there. And the answer to that is, of course, we don't know. But here's what's interesting about your, your question, Kathy. We begin to see interpretations of the Old Testament among the church fathers, very early. And I can't remember if it's the shepherd of Hermes or the letter of Ignatius. But for example, you know, in the book of Joshua, there's the story of the Israelites coming in to take the city. And God tells them, you're going to have to destroy the city. But they go to the house of of Rahab, the prostitute, and she hides them from the men that are going to come and get them. And she says to them, I know that God has given you this city, so spare me and my family. And they say, bring your whole family into the house and hold a a red or a, a scarlet cord outside on the city wall so that we'll know that, you know, that's your house and it won't be destroyed. The church fathers repeatedly interpret that as a hint, as a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ being shed for our salvation. And it occurs as early as the mid-second century. There are so many things that are ways in which the church looks at the the interpretation of the Old Testament. Now, we, we do want to be careful here because the church has never really, as far as I can tell, uh, definitively said, this is how you have to interpret this text of Scripture. In fact, the way that the church generally deals with different interpretations of Scripture, is to be very open. What it usually does is put parameters around it to say, you can interpret it any way within these parameters, within this circle, just don't go outside of it. In other words, that's the same way about the Council of Nicaea and the Trinity. But it's quite possible that, yeah, that many of these things were passed on verbally, and that's one of the things that the Didache shows us. In the New Testament, there's very little about the liturgy of the church. But the Didache is a witness to what must have been passed on from the apostles down. Because regardless of where you look in the history of the church, if you look at a deeper level, there's a remarkable continuity in the liturgy, liturgies of the church. 
Teresa Cotter has a question. She says, perhaps you'll get to this, but when was the term Trinity first used? I think actually it was Tertullian. They used Trinitas. I have to go back and look and see. I'll do a search, word search on Clement of Alexandria and Origen and the Alexandrian fathers before the Nicene Calendar to see if the Greek word triade or triados uh, is used. But it is used in Tertullian for sure at toward the end of the second century. But again, it wasn't necessarily defined in the same way that it was defined at the Council of Nicaea. That's why I think Arius could think that, you know, what he was saying was was orthodox. By the way, remember, heretics don't ever think of themselves as being heretics, right? They're out there to teach orthodoxy, they think. And the beauty of the councils, and this reason why we believe them to be definitive, that is, you can't go against the councils, is precisely because it's the whole church speaking in the ecumenical council. And again, just in terms of my own personal history, that was one of the things that convinced me that's the only way you can keep orthodoxy is by having ecumenical councils uh, of the church to define what's within the parameters of orthodoxy. Uh, Jan asks, could you explain the difference in our understanding of God that resulted from the filioque? How does the Catholic understanding of God differ from the Eastern Catholics and the Orthodox Christians? In the Dictionary of Catholic Theology in French, the Dictionnaire de Catholique, the Théologie Catholique, there's about, I seem to remember about 120 pages on that. Uh, it's a huge subject. How does it differ? Hmm. There are very, I'm going to use a pejorative word here, rigid, orthodox people who would say that we have a either heretical or certainly deficient view of the Trinity. They would say, I think, although Father Hezekiah probably could answer this better than me, I think they would say that we don't understand the Father as being the source of life and love within the Trinity. That we sort of, in making Father, Son, Holy Spirit equal, we don't understand the flow of, within the Trinitarian life. There's even a bigger difference between us in the sense that Western theologians emphasize the fact that someday we'll be able to see the essence of God. The Eastern fathers said, no, we'll never be able to see the essence of God. We'll only be able to see what they call the energies of God. Now, we could, could talk about that. That's going to take us quite far afield. But this debate took place in the 4th century and much later in, in Byzantium. Now, here's the way that I view it, and I'm open to learning on this point. I mean, I'm by no means an expert on this point. I think what we have is this. I think we have two different traditions, East and West, of language about the Holy Trinity. And that language if pushed to its extreme, could be viewed as contradictory. But you can step back from that, and you can ask the question, this different language, slightly differences of language, are they compatible? And I think that the greatest, best theologians of the church have arrived at the answer of, yes, they are compatible. They are different expressions, but they're compatible with one another. So that in essence, what the Greek-speaking fathers were teaching and what the Latin-speaking fathers were teaching, they use different analogies, they use different language, but it's not in essence different. Let me give you an analogy. The Western and Eastern liturgies are definitely different. They use different liturgy. They use different language. Some would even say the emphases are different, and that might be true too. But when you go down beneath the surface, you ask yourself, what's the doctrinal or theological core of those liturgies? And I think they're the same. I know that's not a full answer, but maybe it can at least get us thinking together. Great. And let's finish with a little plug for your book here. Ernest wants to know, what is the name of your book on the explanation of the Didache? This is the book. And it's on Amazon, and it's also 
It was published by the Coming Home Network. I used to I used to work with them. And this is Clement of Rome, the letter, the first letter, because as Daniel alluded there, there's a lot of debate and well, it was just a lot of work to be able to do both of those. So I just did one. And twelve thousand words is a lot. And then they did IK, which is about five thousand words in Greek. But um I think where this one is a little bit unique, if I may advertise for just a moment. The reason that this is different is if you look, you'll see that I have essays in the beginning that I wrote about to help lead the reader in because I've found that modern people have a hard time understanding these ancient documents unless they have some kind of guide. The other thing is at the bottom of the page, there's the translation, and then I have uh, footnotes at the bottom where I comment on what that is. So it's like a biblical commentary. And then the other one is Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp of Smyrna. The martyrdom of Polycarp is in there, the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians, and then the seven letters of Ignatius of Antioch. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Howells. Great evening, great lectures. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.